Let's pray once more before we dig into God's word. We just heard Natanya and Noah talk about how we don't want to give the devil an opportunity. Satan is not harmless. He's not a fairy tale. He and his cohorts are real. And we are not as strong as we think we are. And we are not alone as we gather here today. There are more than just human beings in the room. Of that I am confident. This is war. Let's pray again. Oh God, please, we are weak. We are weak. We are vulnerable. We are not as strong as we think we are. And the devil is no fairy tale. We have a real enemy who hates you and hates us. And we need your help. We need the power of the Spirit in this place, in our hearts, and we need your protection. Not only from the enemy without, but even the enemy within. We underestimate not only Satan, we underestimate sin. It is so deeply rooted in me. It runs so deep. It is so destructive. And it is so easy for us to be blind to our own sin. I know this for myself, my own experience. Oh God, please protect your people. Father, protect us. Father, empower us today. Please bring glory to yourself today. Minister to your people, Lord. Care for the souls of your people here today. And may the gospel be heard by those who are not yet your people today. Oh, we fall on your mercy and we fall on your grace as those who are in Christ. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. My Bible's open to Ephesians 4. I hope that yours is as well if you have a Bible. Last week I, I reached over to the bookshelf in the office and I pulled off the bookshelf a children's song book. A children's song book. And I turned to the table of contents. And I scanned down through the titles of the songs in this children's song book. And I'm going to share some of those with you. And I want you to listen to these song titles. And I want you to see if there's any pattern here in the songs that I've picked out to share with you. Are you ready? A good example. Do it now. Do right. I will do what's right. Obedience. Obey right away. Tell the truth. Now before you pick up any tomatoes to throw at me, please understand I'm not bashing the people who wrote those songs, and I'm not even necessarily criticizing any of those songs. I'm not. After all, obedience is biblical. For example, children should be expected to obey their parents and to obey them promptly. I knew I'd get an amen on that. If nothing else today, I knew I'd get an amen on that. Obeying God, obeying mom, obeying dad, obeying others whom God has put in authority over us. I tell my son this all the time. For this season of your life, God has put your mom in your life. She has authority over you. You need to trust the Lord to help you. Whoever, whomever God has put in authority over us, we are clearly taught in the Bible we're to obey them. Obeying right away is right. Telling the truth, setting a good example, those are truly good things to do. But here is the danger. There is a danger that comes along with such children's songs that really stress obedience. Do it now. Do what's right. Obey right away. Tell the truth. There is a danger 
with such songs. What do you think that danger is? What vital essential truths could our kids or others miss, fail to see, as they sing such songs that are focused on obeying God's commands? Well, here are a couple of essential truths our kids could miss. First of all, one of the biggest dangers is that we can tell our children the what without telling them the why. We can drill into our kids' heads that they need to obey, you need to obey, but we can fail to sufficiently share with them why Christians should obey. Why obey? What's the right motivation for our obedience as Christians? What compels us? Why should we do what we do? Secondly, secondly, we can demand obedience but fail to explain where the power comes from to do that. Okay, I get it, I get it. I'm supposed to obey my mom. I'm supposed to obey my dad. I get it, I get it. But how do I do that? Where does the power come from? In other words, we can tell our children the what without telling them the how. We can fail to answer this very important question. How can I do the hard things that God expects me to do? Now please let me ask you a question. If we beat the drum of obedience without sufficiently explaining the why and the how, what are we going to get? In other words, what kind of disciples do we end up making? What kind of disciples do we end up making if we pound obedience into our children's brains, but we don't tell them the why and the how of obedience. Well, re results may vary. But it's very likely, here's what we're going to get. Here's, what, here's the kind of disciples we're going to make. We're going to make people who are self-righteous, legalistic, hypocritical, and or spiritually anemic. People who think they're following Jesus. People who show up on Sunday and dress right and have good manners, but they don't have the power to truly obey and they're not doing the right things for the right reasons. Without the why and the how, obeying God becomes a pretty ugly mess. God does not just want people who conform to a code of conduct. He wants people who love him and are responding appropriately to what he's done for them and doing so in his power. And for this reason, it's no wonder that Paul invests so much time constructing a massive, and I mean massive, theological foundation in chapters 1 through 3. What is Paul doing? What is Paul doing in chapters 1 through 3? I'll tell you what he's doing. He is constructing, laying down a massive theological foundation before he starts telling these Christians what to do. Paul spends half of the book Chapters 1 through 3, giving these believers in Jesus the why and the how before he gets really to the what in, verses, in chapters 4 through 6. Now, it's not to say that the why and the how are never mentioned in the second half of the book, but it's the why and the how which dominate the early chapters. Let me demonstrate this for you with some statistics. Are you ready? Are you with me? How many explicit imperatives, that is, commands, do you find in the letter of Ephesians? How many? The answer is 41. Secondly, my second question, how many of those imperatives are found in chapters 1 through 3? The answer is 1. Which of course means that 40 out of the 41 imperatives in this letter are found in the second half of this letter. 
The only explicit command in this letter is found in Ephesians 2 verse 11. And you know what the command is? Do you remember what it is in Ephesians 2 verse 11? Remember. Remember. That's the only command in the first half of this book. Secondly, giving you another statistic. How many occurrences of the word therefore are found in this letter? How many times does Paul use the word therefore? The answer is 11. How many times do you find the word therefore in chapter 1? The answer is one time. And it too is found in chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember. Which of course means 10 out of the 11 therefores are in the second half of this letter. What does the word therefore mean? It means something like for that reason or consequently or as a result, as a consequence. In other words, therefore means, here's how I put it, okay? Here's what therefore means. Because of that, now this. Because of that, now this. And, and so now it makes clear sense. Why is therefore almost completely absent in chapters 1 through 3? Because, because he's not ready to tell them what is now because he's still telling them about that in chapters 1 through 3. So as Paul writes this letter to these Christians, it is clear, very clear. He's telling them, here is what God has done for you. Here is what God has waiting for you in Christ. In chapters 1 through 3, picture chapters 1 through 3 of this letter as a literary canvas upon which he is painting this vivid picture, this portrait of what they have in Christ, who they are now in Christ. And he's going to paint this picture it's, it's going to be a rich and beautiful picture. Here's what you got in Christ. He's going to paint that picture before he starts telling them, therefore. Before he urges them to obey. Only then, only after they've been sufficiently informed of their new status and their new source of strength, does Paul really start to exhort them to obedience. It's that thing called gospel logic. The imperatives flow out of the indicatives. Here's who you are. Here's what you have. Here's what God's given to you in Christ. Now, live that out. Walk that out in your life. Don't get the cart before the horse. Don't switch things around. And you know what's fascinating to me? Even after, even after he... He builds this massive theological foundation that is chapters 1 through 3. He adds further support in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. He gives us even more of a foundation, more support for why we should live the way that we should live in verses 4 through 6. It's amazing. And these seven points of unity in those verses, they, as one author wrote, revolve around the three members of the Trinity. So first of all, in verse 1, let's look at what it says here, what Paul wrote. I, therefore, let's see how well you were listening to me or how well I was teaching you. We have the word therefore. Which occurrence is this in this book? Is this... First, second, third, fourth, what, what occurrence of the word therefore is this? Second, that's right, thank you. This is the second time the word therefore shows up in this book. Because of that, because of what I've just been laying out for you in chapters 1 through 3, now this. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you, I exhort you to walk. That's a, that's a, a metaphor for to live, to actively do things, to live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So number one, walk, live worthily of the calling to which you have been called. What is Paul talking about? What is what calling is Paul talking about? He says, walk worthy or worthily of the calling to which you've been called. What is that about? 
was another Bible teacher helpfully pointed out. There's this calling in chapter 2, in verses 4 through 9, that comes after the walking in verses 1 through 3, and before the walking in verse 10, chapter 2. Let me me show it to you really quickly. Turn back in your Bible to Ephesians 2, just really quickly. I I want you to see that between the walking... In verses 1 through 3, and the walking in verse 10, there is a calling. Verses 4 through 9. With me? Walking, walking, and in the middle, calling. Let me show you really quickly. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead, spiritually dead, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That's how you were living. That's how you were living. That's how you were walking. Following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that's not working the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest. So that's how we were walking. That's the first walking. And now in verses 4 through 9, there is the calling. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And now you might look at me and say, I don't see the word call there. I don't see the word calling there. And I'd say, you're right. But I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate that the calling is there. Second walking is in verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I'm just trying to say, between the walking in verses 1 through 3 and the walking in verse 10, you've got a calling in verses 4 through 9. It's the, it's the calling that's found in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. What does Romans chapter 8, verse 30 say? It says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You are called before you're justified. And these folks are justified. They have heard the gospel. They have believed the gospel. They have been saved. How did they get saved? It's because God called them. It's what's going on in 1 Corinthians. Oh, I love this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm so thankful. I'm not thankful enough that in God's great mercy and grace, I'm in on this. You are in on this if you are in Christ. Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 through 24, look at what he says. Jews, Jewish folks, they demand signs. And Greeks, they're looking for wisdom. But what do we do? We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, when I stand up here and I talk about Jesus dying on a cross for our sins and rising again, that might just sound like boring nonsense to you, foolishness. It might be offensive to you. But what Paul says here is that there are exceptions to the rule with both Jews and Gentiles. There are times when that good news about Christ who died, who was crucified, who rose from the dead, when that message goes forward, that the Spirit shows up in the heart of the listener. Ha! And it's no longer foolish or boring or offensive. When the Spirit of God interacts, cooperates, teams up with the Word of God in the heart of a sinner like me, things happen. It's called being called. And if you are a Christian today, you should, you and I, we should thank God that He has done that spiritual miracle in our lives. 
Because it is just that we believed, we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ because the gospel came and the spirit came and worked and that's no small thing and it's all of God. And this calling as it as is laid out it's clearly in Romans 8.30, it's, it's irreversible, it's indestructible. If you've truly been called and justified, my sister, you will be glorified. It is, as theologians call it, the golden chain. If you've truly heard the gospel and you've believed it, you've been justified and you will be glorified. And you and I, we do not deserve that. That was purchased with blood. Oh, please don't look at me with drowsy eyes. Oh, please don't look down on this glorious truth. This calling, this salvation, what we have in Christ is no small thing. It is glorious, glorious beyond my understanding, purchased with blood, a spiritual miracle that I am completely unworthy of, undeserving of, never would have gone looking for this, would have still been foolish and boring and or offensive to me if the Spirit had not come that day, that night in August of 1996 and brought life to this dead sinner in his living room Stevens Point, Wisconsin. I should fall on my knees, I should say, thank you God. Thank you, God. How do I respond? What now? Yes, I praise you. Yes, I give you thanks. But what else? Well, Paul's going to tell us what else. He's going to tell us what else. Oh, oh, and this hope that we're called to, as it says there, that hope that we're supposed to walk worthily of, live up to, that hope, you know, that, that call, I should say, it comes with the hope. Look at verse 4. Look at that second half of verse 4. This calling with which we've been called, it comes with a hope. It says in the second half of verse 4, Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Paul talks about this back in chapter 1, verse 18 as well. He's praying for them again. He says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he called you. The, the further results of this call that took place between the walk in verse 1 through 3 and the walk in verse 10, the, the further results of this are detailed in chapter 2 verse 11 and following. We have not just been rescued from the wrath of God. It's not just that God has, has, has rescued us from a rightful place in the lake of fire. It's not just that God has forgiven us of our sins and restored me or you to a right relationship with God. It is grander. It is broader. He has placed us in a family. We are a part of this thing called the church, the body of Christ. We're united now to God and to each other. And what Paul is about to do after laying the massive foundation, and before he gives it even further support, what he's about to do is to exhort us, to urge us to now live in a way that fits with what he's done for us, what God's done for us in Christ. Considering who we are and what we have and what we have waiting for us, let's conduct the rest of our lives accordingly. That's what Paul's doing here. Here's an illustration that you may have heard before. I'm sorry if it's a rerun for you. Some people have used the illustration of the person who's elected to be the President of the United States. That man or that woman is elected to be the President of this country. And that person is expected to live up to such an office. To conduct himself or herself accordingly. You're the President. You sit in the Oval Office. You're the, the leader of this great nation. So, so live accordingly. And the negative classic illustration is Richard Nixon. Mr. Nixon did not live up to what he had been given, did he? Old Mr. Nixon was not honest Abe. 
And he had to leave. He had to walk his shameful self out to the helicopter and fly off in shame because he didn't live up to the office, to the privileged status that he'd been given. He was a dishonest liar. And God through Paul, God through Paul, this morning is urging, exhorting you and I you and me, us, to live up to our calling in Christ, to consider well what God's done for us in Christ, to look long, to think hard about what God has done, what it took, the blood that was spilled, the power that was exercised. Think about that. Look long upon that. And then, and then, and then, and only then, So your obedience is not some cold, mechanical, hypocritical, ugly obedience. Then, with a heart that is grateful, let your decision-making from that day forward be influenced, changed accordingly. Let, Let your heart be reshaped. Let your priorities be rearranged. Let the way you talk to other people, your attitudes, the way you talk about people when they're not in the room, the way you respond to mistreatment, the way you handle those thorny people in the church, let the way you interact with those people be forever changed in grateful response to what Christ has done for you, the way he's treated you. That's what's going down right here. That's what Paul is doing. And remember, we can only, only, boys and girls, you can only walk worthily if you rely on the Holy Spirit. That's the only way it can happen. Let's look now at verses 2 and 3. With all humility, he said, I'm I'm urging you to live a certain way as a grateful response to what you've been given in Christ. And let me get specific now. With all humility or lowliness and gentleness or meekness, with patience, bearing with one another. This is church, y'all. This is community, y'all. This ain't just me and Jesus. No, we've been put in a family, and and there's local expressions of that spiritual family. It's called the local church. Find one, plug in, be engaged. Don't bail out. And as you live life with these other Christians, as you do that, you live, you walk this way, all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Make every effort, or in other words, as one Bible puts it, spare no effort to maintain, to hold on to the unity that's already yours, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul spoke much of peace In chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, the peace that we have with God, the peace that we have with each other. I love the fact that although we are dominantly one ethnicity here today, we're not just one ethnicity here today. I love the fact that not everybody in this room agrees about this thing called COVID or this thing called vaccines. I love that. I love that not everyone in this room educates their kids the same way. That's good. That's good. That's good. This is unity, not uniformity. We can truly be at peace with each other. If you're talking Jew-Gentile, if you're talking something else, something else, we can be at peace with each other. We already have peace. It's just a matter of are we fighting for it? Is it important to you? Is it important to me to live at peace with other people who are in Christ? Does that matter to you? Do you value the relationships? Are you willing to fight for those things? That's what's going on here. 
That's what Paul's talking about. This walking, this living worthily involves actively pursuing loving unity. Well, what does that look like specifically? It involves humility, gentleness, patience, and endurance. Where can I get that? How does that happen? Holy Spirit. It is a, it, these types of things are the fruit, the, the produce of the Spirit of God who is inside of you if you are in Christ. It looks, like, it looks like the attitude and the behavior of the Lord Jesus as he interacted with his disciples. It looks like the way that the Lord Jesus dealt with the Apostle Peter and the other apostles on the very night that Jesus was arrested and at other times. Humility. Lowliness. What is humility? It's an accurate assessment of yourself. It's not saying, I am nobody, I'm nothing. It's saying, I see myself with clarity. It's not having an inflated view of ourselves. It means never forgetting who we once were and what it took to forgive us. It means not forgetting what kind of deliverance we've experienced in Ephesians 2 and elsewhere. It means that we all agree with God that we still are sinners. You know, there's a branded church out there that says, once you come to Christ, you stop sinning. <laughs> I guess somebody should have told Peter that. When you come to Christ, yes, your sins are washed away. And yes, you have power you never had before. Yes, you can live differently. But we are still sinners, and we should not forget that. And when we don't forget that, that helps us with the humility thing. We still sense our need for mercy and grace. It means we recognize that we are what we are by the grace of God. Have you made progress? Good for you. Have you taken steps of maturity? Good for you. You don't swear like you used to swear? Good for you. You don't look at porn like you used to look at porn? Good for you. You love your wife like you should? Or not like you should, because none of us do. But better than you used to? You're a little bit more intentional and thoughtful? A little less selfish than you used to be? Good for you! I mean it. That's, that's, that's what ought to be happening in all of our lives. But we should never forget any genuine good growth, change in our lives is owed to the grace of God. I know you're sick of me saying it. But my brothers and sisters, it's true. I am what I am by the grace of God, full stop. And when we remember that, listen to me, when you remember that, it produces humility. When you stop taking credit for what you did not pull off, it means humility. Because you're accurately thinking about yourself and your own accomplishments. That's humility. And as my dear brother said, no one gives grace better than the person who recognizes that he or she needs it, him or herself. Do you have a hard time being patient with people? Hard time giving grace to other sinners? Maybe it's because you don't sense your own need for grace. It's far easier. Listen, here's, here's a pro tip from your pastor. It's far easier to associate with other sinners. And I'm talking people in this church or where you work, or in your own family, it's far easier to associate with those sinners and to give them grace when you do not forget that you yourself are a great sinner who has received great grace. If I can keep that focus, if I can say, me, yes, a sinner, a great sinner. Yes, me, a person who's received great grace, guess what? I can give that back to you. I can, I can show you the mercy that God's shown me. What do you, why do you think Paul kept coming back around to that? Why do you think Paul never got past that? It produced humility in his life. It drove him. And it should drive us. Pride says, I am better. And I deserve better. That's pride talking. I'm better. And I deserve better. Are you a discontented person? 
Nothing's ever good enough for you. Nobody's ever good enough for you. Everything stinks. It's not at your level. You're not satisfied. Where does that come from? What's pumping that out? Maybe it's pride. I am better. I deserve better than you. I deserve better than this. You do? That sounds like pride talking. Maybe it is. Why is humility so important? Why does Paul go here first? With all humility, why is that his leadoff batter? Because pride leads to disunity. Whereas humility leads to unity. You can see this in your own family. Can't you? And a thousand other places. Pride divides, humility unites, as others have pointed out. Let's notice what Paul is not saying. Again, in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness. Paul is not saying this. He's not, he's not leaning over and saying, hey, hey, a little bit of humility might help. Is he saying that? No, he's not saying that. You know, can you just, you know, try to get a little, you know, bring it down a little bit. A little bit of humility, you know, might not hurt. Is that what he's saying? He's not saying that. He's not saying, hey, you know, try to be a little more gentle, okay? Just, you know, try not to be like a, a bull in the china shop. You know, just try to, you know, bring it down. You know, try to be a little more gentle. That's not what he's saying. Because what word does he use? With what? Oh. He chose that word for a reason. All gentleness and humility, a lowliness. He's not talking in bare minimum terms. You know, try to be nice. Stop hitting your sister. Please. No, oh, no, no. This is all out lowliness. Not false humility, not, not phony humility, genuine lowliness, accurate self perception. Sinners saved by grace still need it today. Going to need it till the day I die. Oh, I've received so much grace. I'm happy to give it to you too. Gentleness. What's that? We're talking meekness here. And as others have pointed out, meekness is not what? Weakness. And the classic illustration is the powerful horse. I'm a city slicker, so don't expect me to get this right. But you have these powerful horses so much strength, and that can be controlled, controlled, under control. That's what meekness is. As one author put it, Jesus was gentle and humble in heart. See Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, his self-description, humble, gentle, but he was not weak. Jesus, meek and mild, yeah. But Jesus, weak and mild? Nah. He was not weak. Meekness, gentleness, it means, again, as that author that I just referred to says so well. Oh, this is beautiful. Are you listening? Don't check out on me. What is meekness? What does gentleness look like? Here's what it looks like. Here's part of it. This is part of it. It means always being angry when we should be angry and never being angry when we should not be angry. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Did Jesus ever get angry? But he only got angry when he should have been angry. And he was never angry when he should not have been angry. That's a part of what this whole gentleness thing is about. It means we don't normally wound people with our words. How do people usually walk away from your presence feeling? Beat up? Or blessed, as another pastor put it. Bruised or blessed. That's not to say that we never have hard conversations. That's, there's no way we could say that. It's not to say we don't gently rebuke or even strongly rebuke at other times. It does not mean that we never confront sin out of love for God, out of love for others, and or out of the love for out of love for the gospel. The Bible never calls us to be schmoozers or flatterers. Just saying nice things so people will feel good or like us. 
That's not what the Bible calls us to do. That's not how Christ operated. The Bible never calls us to that. Our number one goal is not just to make people happy. The Apostle Paul rebuked the Apostle Peter publicly. Got in his grill. Publicly. Why? Because Paul had an anger problem? No, because Paul loved Christ. And he loved Peter. And he loved the gospel. Boy, that had to hurt Peter. It must have been painful for Peter. But the proverb gets it right. You remember the old proverb? 27.6 Faithful are the what? Wounds of a what? Friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. But listen to me closely, please. Most of our conversations should not be confrontations. <laughs> People should not think when, you, when they get a text message or a phone call or you walk up to them, they should not be assuming that you're going to give it to them verbally. Most of our conversations should not be confrontations. What does a worthy walk look like? It also involves patience. With all humility and gentleness, with Patience. What is patience? It means giving others the time and space that they need to grow. You know, kind of like how God gave you and is giving you time and space to grow. We don't expect people to be mature now. <laughs> Do you expect that of your kids? Hey, welcome to the world. Good to have you, Hadley. Why are you crying? What's wrong? Expect obedience, we expect maturity. Now, we expect that of a little baby girl, or a six year old, or a 10 year old, or a 16 year old. We give our kids space and time to grow. We do the same thing with others in the church. We wait for others to come along. Are you farther down the road of sanctification than that guy over there? Good for you. Are you more mature than her? Good for you. Give her time to catch up. It's called patience. When we are exercising patience, we're not demanding that people be mature now or yesterday. It's like a farmer. It's like a farmer who has planted his seed in the ground and now he's got to wait for months to see any results. That's called patience. Right, Scott? you got to wait for those crops to come. Now, someone might say, you know, I'm just, I'm just not a patient person. I'm just not a patient person. I'm just not wired that way. Just, just not, not patient. Again, I push you back and I say, or I push, I push back on that, I should say. I'm not going to push you. I push back on that and I say, why is that? Why? Does it have anything to do with your pride? Is it possibly pride that keeps you from having time for people who aren't like you? For people who aren't at your level? Are you easily irritated? Where did that come from? What's up with that? Maybe it's pride. Someone might say, look, I just have a short fuse. Now don't blame me. I, I was just born this way. I was just born with a short fuse. I, got, I just got a short fuse. And one pastor said, well, how about you pray for a long one? Oh, I see, you got a short fuse, how about you pray for a long one? Because the Spirit of God is in you if you are in Christ, and He can give you a long fuse. And as we meditate on how patient God's been with us, how long a fuse God has had with us, then we can have a long fuse with her, or with Him. Lastly, in this list here, we have this forbearing one another in love. You could translate that endurance in love. This is more than tolerating people. This is bearing with one another in love. This is refusing to give in to resentment or bitterness as we rub shoulders with people who rub us the wrong way. Is there anybody in this church who rubs you the wrong way? Maybe it's the guy who's talking to you right now. Well, guess what? You probably rub somebody else the wrong way. And how do you deal with that? You endure, you forbear with love. You don't just put up with people. 
Let's think about the Lord Jesus. According to what's in the word of God, do we frequently, frequently find Jesus berating his followers? I mean, just chewing them up one side and down the other? Is that what we find with Jesus? Is that what you've got in your Bible? Was he constantly at them, criticizing them? No, 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 no. Hey, Peter. No, 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 no. John, what are you doing? Is that what you find? Did he give up on them? Boy, who would have blamed him if he had, huh? Did he suffer along with those guys? He sure did. Verse 3 again. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Oh, this is beautiful. We don't make up, we don't manufacture this unity that we have. We just maintain it. And I say just, but I should say must. We must maintain it. And again, this is not cheap. It's not throwaway unity paid for with blood. We, 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 we seek this unity out of gratitude. We spare no effort. Bond of peace. Bond of peace, it says. We dare not pull apart what God's put together. Be careful how you handle, sorry, maybe that's not the right word. Be careful how you treat the church. Oh, that little Faith Baptist Church, Carol, who cares about that church? You know, they're still meeting in a gym. Well, they got like, what, 30, 40 people? Who cares about that church? You be careful how you treat a church. Because God has his eye on every one of his churches, big or small. Be careful how you treat the church. This says we are supposed to eagerly maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. In other words, don't snap the chains of peace that bring us, tie us together. Don't snap those chains. Be careful. Be careful. Hold on to what God's given to us in Christ. Now verses 4 through 6. Again, I, I further support, as if chapters 1 through 3 wasn't enough, further support coming down the road at us in verses 4 through 6. Sevenfold. Look at this. Count up the ones. One body. What is that? This is the church. I believe one spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Number four. One Lord. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Number five. One faith. Our faith in Christ. I believe this is our faith in him. Number six. One baptism. And number seven, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Wow. So walking, living worthily involves actively remembering what unites us. And I just really transparently tell you, I, I, I've got room to grow for sure in understanding how much I have in common with you. Paul says... Look at what you have. Look what is yours. And look what you have in common. We have so much that unites us, my sister. We have so much that unites us, my brother. You might like the Hawkeyes, and I like the Cyclones. You might reach for, root for the Dodgers, and I re, root for the Cubs. Are they in the same league? Probably not. I don't know. You're a, you're a Bears fan, he's a Packers fan. You're a city slicker, they're out on the farm. You homeschool your kids, you're sending your kids to public school. You got vaccinated and you've got the third booster that's out there, you ain't getting vaccinated. Guess what, our unity is not about football teams or baseball teams or occupations or school choices or vaccines. Our unity is far more profound than any of that earthly temporary junk. I have so much in Christ. We have so much in Christ and we have it, my brothers, my sisters, in common. 
What I've got, you've got. Wow. Wow. We have so much that unites us. No wonder Paul's saying, live united. Hold on to the unity that's yours. Walk this way because look at what you've got, what you, plural, have. It's interesting for whatever it's worth that all three members of the Trinity are mentioned in verses 4 through 6, but they're in the opposite order as we usually find them in our creeds or doctrinal statements. You've got the Spirit, the Son, and then the Father, and that's the same way that Paul does it in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6. Same Spirit, same Lord, same Father. Let me just close by saying this. We have more in common than I thought. If you are a gospel believer, if you trust in Christ, we have more in common than I thought. Our unity in Christ is so much deeper and richer than we often realize. And Paul's just saying, yeah, that's right. Now live it out. Live it out. As a grateful response and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray that way. Father, thank you so much for our privilege, our opportunity to look hard at chapters 1 through 3 before we ever stepped into chapter 4. Thank you for letting us think long about these passages of how you've blessed us, Father, in Christ. And thank you, Lord, for how non-individualistic this is, how, dare I say it, un-American this is. Yes, my sins are forgiven. Yes, I am not going to the lake of fire. Yes, I belong to Jesus, but I don't just belong to Jesus. I belong to his body. I'm a part of this thing called the church, and what is mine is theirs, and theirs is mine. What we have is deep and rich. Our unity is profound. No wonder the Apostle Paul finally transitions and urges us to live accordingly. Oh God, please, please help us not to just have the what, but help us to have very clearly the how and the, and the why by your Spirit. In response, just in response to what you've given to us, oh God, help us to, to live up to the calling that we've been called to. Help us to be people of lowliness, real deal, genuine humility, gentleness, bearing with one another love, being patient, giving people time and space to grow, to come along. Oh God, may, that, may those things show up here in this little church, meeting in this gym. Oh God. May you be pleased. May you be pleased. Oh God, please don't let us miss what is ours in Christ. Please don't let us miss what we have in common in Christ. And oh God, help us to then live accordingly by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.